Fantastic. I think we'll uh, kick off. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Um, welcome to our dear members, of course, and, and uh, AHK Austral Australian friends. Um, it's great to have a fantastic turnout today. We've got um, over 40 people in already, um, expecting a few more. Uh, very excited to have a fantastic panel today for a webinar that's probably a topic dear to everyone or that's that's caused quite a bit of headache for a lot of people over the last let's say 18 months um, there's been some very tough times and I think what we've seen a couple of months in the uh, Suez Canal with a ship stuck in there is is a very good picture to to depict all the troubles that everyone's gone through um, we've had a lot of challenges and and, and I think we'll we'll have some conversations coming up that that highlight that and also what we can do into the future from a panel to get around that um, especially in, in technological areas and in industry 4.0 um, ideas before we get too far into everything I would like all attendees to just uh, note that we do have a chat function and a Q&A function so please do feel free to send your questions through at any time um, and in the chat function, you can also send us through a little bit of a summary um, if, you, if you would like on what has provided you with headaches over the last 18 months in terms of logistics and supply chains, just to give our speakers a bit of an idea too on, on what the audience is like. Um, and I think also to just share um, experiences with, with other participants, so I think that would be fantastic. Um, now, without too much ado, I just want to introduce our speakers to you. I'm just going to briefly share my screen to do so. There we go. So we've got a fantastic expert panel today of four speakers. I'm going to start with Matthew Morgan, who is also the event partner today, associate partner at uh, Crow Australasia. Matthew is a licensed customs broker and international trade specialist with over 18 years of experience working in the logistics and professional services industries. His experience is complemented by university studies in international business, public relations and customs administration. Matthew is actively involved with, within the National Committee for Trade Facilitation or NCTF, which is the primary group that actively engages with the Department of Home Affairs on uh, trade modernization initiatives. With a passion for emerging technologies and logistics 4.0, Matthew incorporates integrated digital solutions within the service offering to help clients optimize the supply chains, navigate the regulatory burdens of global trade and succeed in new markets. Matthew is shortly also gonna provide everyone with a brief overview of what the situation in the global logistics and uh, supply chains industries looks like before he will then moderate our uh, expert panel. Secondly, I'd like to introduce to you V. V is the founder of Bridgepoint Advisory. She is uh, formerly the stakeholder engagement manager for the ICT e-commerce and agriculture um, with uh, Standard, Standard Australia. Um, sorry, I just forgot how to English. There we go. Um, and the secretariat for the Australian Mirror Committee on to ISO and IEC, Joint Technical Committee 1 for, the informa uh, for Information Technology. During her time with Standards Australia, she led the development of the Australian Smart City Standards Roadmap, published in August 2020, to coincide with the release of the New South Wales State Government's Smart Places Strategy. V further spearheaded the creation of a number of Australian mirror committees and working groups around topics of smart cities, digital twins, and sustainable cities and communities. After leaving Standards Australia in late, uh, late last year, V has established her own startup consultancy firm, Bridgepoint Advisory, to provide research and advice in digital standards. And she is currently the connectivity standards lead for New South Wales Telco Authority and a member of the Standards Australia Digital Twin Working Group. Third, we've got Phil Hocking from Facht Australia. He's the gen general manager of project consulting. He's a specialist in international trade and logistics before joining Facht. His career included 23 years as general manager of a German-based freight forwarder and 13 years as general manager of a Swiss-based testing inspection and certification company. 
Philip has worked extensively on large logistics projects throughout Asia, Europe, and the Americas. And he is also the past president and a current board member of the uh, Swiss Australia Chamber of Commerce or the Swiss Cham. Last but very much not least, we've got Lawrence Christoffels. He's the chairperson at the Ethical Trade Alliance. He has over 20 years of experience in international trade development, logistics optimization, and supply chain solutions. He's a highly experienced and respected speaker at events ranging from trade delegations to conferences and networking events domestically as well as abroad. In addition to his current roles as the chairperson at the Ethical Trade Alliance, he is also the host of the Trade Australia show on Import Export TV. And Lawrence also volunteers his expertise on a number of industry boards, committees, and special interest groups. A massive thank you to all our speakers today for your time. Um, I'm sure you've got great insights for us on, uh, on the topic. And I'm going to hand over to Matthew to kick off the discussions. Thank you, Matthias. It's uh, a pleasure to be here today, um, supporting the, uh, the German Chamber with this very timely and topical event. Um, so without further ado, I will uh, begin uh, the presentation. So without uh, a doubt, the last 18 months have been unexpected. The global pandemic has impacted everyone somehow and our lives have indeed been transformed from what we once knew and experienced as usual. COVID-19 has impacted our personal and professional lives and we have learned in our own ways how to adapt to a new normal. In the context of the business world, many companies have been able to adapt to the changes quickly and are doing very well in the current environment. Other businesses are not coping as well. However, there is still time available to adapt and adjust to minimize the impacts before it's too late. While I certainly don't claim to have all the answers to the current supply chain challenges, I hope you all will be able to take away some key insights from this session with some food for thought. I'm sure that we would all agree that the pandemic has disrupted global supply chains far beyond what the average economist would have ever anticipated. If we look at the source of manufacturing inputs, including the extraction and sourcing of raw materials from mines, fisheries and agricultural industries, the majority have been affected by pandemic shutdowns across the globe. Natural disasters in many parts of the world, including Germany, haven't helped either with widely reported supply chain shortages. In late August, hundreds of ships were reportedly stranded outside congested ports worldwide, waiting for unloading. Even when global shipping is not grappling with these disruptions, seafarers are currently facing some age old hazards. There is increasing piracy against ships worldwide, and the regional and global powers are beginning to exert their dominance over critical trade routes. Australia is not immune to these shocks to the global trade system, with Australian retailers warning consumers on numerous accounts that Christmas shopping could be interrupted. At the current rate of disruption, Santa will have fewer toys, electronics, leisure equipment and homewares to deliver. Consumers should expect delays and price hikes for shipped goods. Unprecedented, abnormal and astronomical, that's a mouthful, isn't it? Those are some of the phrases used to describe the post-COVID global shipping crisis, which has seen container shipping rates quadruple since the start of the year. Took, take a look at any freight index and it will show you that it is very expensive. It has gotten to send a 40 foot container from one end of the world to the other. Freight rates from China to Europe and China to New York are continuing to rise. And it's not unusual to now see rates as high as 25,000 USD per container on those trade lanes. Prices like these could cause inflation and more. 
but rising freight rates are not just about cost pressures for importers and higher prices at your local Kmart. They are distorting the very nature of the global container shipping trade and Australian importers and exporters are not immune. So how did we get here and what does it mean for the Australian economy? One of the main drivers in demand is from the United States and Europe. In America, demand for containerized goods has risen as much as 40% compared to pre-pandemic levels. And that's mainly due to the fiscal stimulus provided to American consumers during the pandemic's peak last year. People are working from home, but they still have cash available to spend on home appliances, furniture, and home gym equipment. This demand creates container flow priorities across specific trade lanes, particularly from Far East Asia to the USA and Europe. While European demand has only risen 3%, the demand rush in America has seen the cost of freight from Asia to Europe soar. Freight rates from China to Australia have also risen due to the spike in global activity, but are cheaper than those paid by importers in North America and Europe, but that's still a big problem. As container rates run hot on the world's most famous trade lanes, increasingly ships that previously ran routes from Shanghai to places like Australia, Africa, New Zealand, and South America are being placed on more lucrative trade routes. The outcome of this supply and demand dilemma is that Australia is not a priority market for most shipping lines. Shipping lines can get better prices by positioning the containers on the China-US or China-Europe trade lanes. The struggle to get container space on board vessels is a reality and companies are willing to pay top dollar to get it. In Australia at the moment, prices are around 8,000 to 9,000 to the east coast of Australia. Now I have to pause there because I had a conversation with um, a colleague this morning who told me that actually an FAK uh, price from uh, China to Australia now is um, sitting around 10 or $11,000 US per container. So as of um, preparing for this speech, the prices have gone up. Um, with a massive difference in margins to send containers from China to the US or Europe, it puts less profitable transits to Australia at the back end of the queue, making it increasingly more challenging to get imported goods to Australia. Think about it, eight to $10,000 a container in the Australian market. In the mind of the shipping lines, they see how profitable it is to service the American or the European market at $25,000 a container. There's a real struggle with the shipping lines to justify equipment requests. And there's also an actual equipment deficit at the moment in China. As a result of this, massive delays and massive costs are coming down the line. With just about every container ship on the world, in the world, out in the high seas, shipping lanes and ports are facing unprecedented levels of delays and congestion, which adds to importers' issues. Even before bottlenecks from the Ever Given incident, which Matthias mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, COVID outbreaks at important global ports, action between Australian wharfies and port terminal operators also complicate supply chains. Many ports have labor shortages or are not optimized to deal with the volume of trade demand driven by international stimulus spending. There's been a genuine issue of getting raw materials to global manufacturers impacting their ability to make products. With all of these issues relating to shipping, it's not surprising that air freight rates have also skyrocketed International airlines have pulled out of commercial air routes due to fewer people moving between countries. That situation has emerged as stricter arrival caps imposed by Canberra during COVID outbreaks out of hotel quarantine have obliterated the financial viability of international passenger flights. One client I spoke to recently said that their monthly air freight of 100 tonnes of cargo from Europe to Australia cost them half a million dollars pre-pandemic. It went up to over a million dollars when we first went into lockdown in April last year. 
this client quickly pivoted to adjust their strategy, moving some of the products usually sent by air to sea to balance the cost. 60% of their freight now travels by sea and 40% via air freight. The shift to sea freight has meant increased lead time is required to ensure production and shipping can occur to meet deadlines. Right now, it's clear that the global shipping system is in a perfect storm of pandemic related events from COVID outbreaks and port closures to increased demand for goods transported by sea. And the bottlenecks will likely persist. How long will the global shipping crisis take to unwind? Many experts do not see any easing in the supply chain crunch until latter half of next year. If the supply chain challenges are likely to continue for the foreseeable future, what can global traders do to minimize the risk of disruption and impact on their supply chains? What are some of the opportunities that are available to companies, not only to adapt, but to have a competitive edge on the other side of lockdowns? In today's panel discussion, we will investigate practical solutions for organizations to improve their supply chain and be more adaptable to logistical challenges. So this is where I will um, pause for a moment and um, begin uh, uh, with Lawrence. Um, Lawrence, um, good to uh, see you again today, uh, albeit uh, virtually. Um, the, the first question is uh, certainly um, up your alley with regards to uh, technology um, and uh, ethical trade alliance. I'm sure you can relate and, and provide good examples of how technology um, fits into the context. But the first question is, how can the use of technology in the supply chain support procurement in the current environment? Great question, Matt. Um, and thanks, Matthew and, and Matthias, for, for including me in today's session. I'm really uh, privileged to be part of such an esteemed group of panelists. So um, thank you. Getting to that question, I think technology in the supply chain, especially that picture you've just painted that we've all experienced over the last 18 months, it's all around visibility and data drives visibility. I think uh, typically in a procurement model, you'd be looking at uh, forecasting. Forecasting typically comes from uh, historical data, but right now uh, it's everything's unprecedented. So all those old forecasts are pretty much thrown out the window and therefore technology becomes so much more important because you have to be able to think as quickly and adjust as quickly as you can. And the, the more data that you've got to work with, which, which is up to date and accurate, then you can make better decisions when it comes to your procurement and your, your supply chain. So I think when it comes to using technology, it comes down to first and foremost, communicating what the business needs are, understanding the whole uh, fulfillment pipeline and moving back through that to your suppliers, making sure your communication strategies and, and visibility with your suppliers and you mentioned the raw material bottlenecks that a lot of countries are experiencing. So I think having really clear lines of communication around what their production schedules are like, the uh, fulfillment or order fulfillment capabilities are like, and then looking at your supply chain or, or transport logistics movements, all that comes down to technology where instead of trying to rely on, you know, outdated things like email or schedules, you really need to have uh, integrated systems, integrated information uh, platforms. And if you can also look at traceability, uh, provenance of those raw materials right through to every, every of those milestones, manufacturing, dispatch, um, arrivals, all those type of things enable companies to reduce cost and improve their service. Because right now, as you've, you've pointed out already, Matthew, is that um, the costs have gone right through the roof. So every 1% that you can save through making smarter decisions or changing your discharge, or as you said, with some of your case studies, just pivoting your, your, your shipment methods. Even when it comes to your order profiles, instead of doing um, 40 foots, you might wanna do more frequent 20 foots, or you might, you might wanna change the way that your products are being moved around, but you can only do that effectively and maintain a level of control and agility when it comes to the right technology. 
Thanks, Lawrence. Spot on. And I think what you've um, essentially described there is the importance of having that visibility across the supply chain. Only then, once you've got that visibility, can you monitor, measure, and I would like to say with um, the, uh, the technology that we have now with artificial intelligence, beginning to be able to predict. And um, so when you'll be able to uh, predict your supply chain, be able to forecast um, duty costs, say, for example, as a customs broker, you know, being familiar with the effect um, of, of duty rates on the supply chain, um, monitoring the freight amounts, also considering different countries of origin. Um, obviously, as we know, certain countries have preferential trade agreements, but in the absence of that, um, a spreadsheet only goes so far as to be able to give you um, a reliable uh, source of truth. So when you've got integrated digital platforms, um, it enhances um, the ability to adapt. Phil, um, I guess from the, the context of um, uh, freight forwarding and project management, uh, what are some of the strategies that your clients have implemented to avoid and reduce the impact of disruptions within their supply chains, given the, the current global uncertainties in international trade? Yeah, look, uh, thanks for the question. I suppose my first comment would be that um, it's uh, the most important thing for our clients to do, uh, for our clients anyway, is to inform us about what they're planning um, as early as possible. So the earlier a freight forwarder can understand what the client is about to do or wants to do, um, the, the freight forwarder can then put in the strategy. So um, the idea is to take a lot of those, um, um, uh, those worries and planning issues away from the actual client and uh, let the freight forwarder work on that. Um, to give you an example, um, but you mentioned about dis disruptions. Uh, I just want to mention two things. We've got uh, disruptions caused by COVID, vessels running aground, piracy, whatever. And a lot of people focus on, on that. They forget about the dis disruptions that happen every year. And uh, I had a client... Uh, very recently ring up and ask me uh, questions about how they should prepare for uh, issues to do with COVID and issues to do with shortage of containers. And they completely forgotten that in a couple of weeks, it's golden week in China, which is one of the biggest disruptions that we have every year. So uh, the first thing is to, uh, to, to plan ahead, but to um, inform your logistics company as early as possible about what you're gonna have. Uh, which enables them to um, book space, um, have uh, equipment uh, available for, for their consignments, um, and also look at contingencies for sending freight via uh, other routes. Uh, for instance, if it's coming out of Central Europe um, and, and there's a container shortage in, in Hamburg or Rotterdam or Antwerp, it, it may be a, an alternative to, to, to send the, the cargo via Italy, as an example. Uh, similarly, in, in the States, there, there's various Eastern and West Coast port options. Um, so the, the best strategy for the importer, uh, the most important thing from my side, is to um, plan as much ahead as, as possible. Um, as soon as you've placed an order with your supplier, let your freight forwarder know um, so they, they can start planning ahead and, and uh, inform the, the client about any uh, issues that they, um, that they may expect. I, I think we're, we're at risk of, um, of uh, painting a bit of gloom and doom on, on shipping. Um, and th there's, a, there's obviously issues with container shortages and freight rate increases and whatever. But at the end of the day, um, ships come in every day into Australia, into every port, and they unload thousands of, of, of containers. So uh, I think that there will be disruptions. There will always be some sort of a di disruption. There will always be uh, floods in, in, in China or um, shipping strikes in Europe or vice versa. Um, so I, I think it's important not to, to paint a too negative picture about the, the logistics um, 
um, uh, world at the moment. Freight rates are incredibly high, um, but again, the, the best way to, to, to uh, minimize the, the freight increases is to, to plan ahead as, as much as, as possible, uh, which gives um, uh, uh, freight forwarders the, the opportunity to, to book it as early as possible with the shipping line, try and negotiate rates, um, uh, look at various options, uh, and be in a position to, to, to negotiate. Thanks, Phil. I think one of the things that you've really highlighted there is the importance of clear communication. Yeah. And, um, you know, trade stakeholders, the better communication flows, um, it allows for planning in advance and um, it minimizes the, um, the potential for things to go wrong in the supply chain. So from origin uh, or conception to consumption, as they say, having that visibility across multiple touch, point, touch points, as well as um, all of the key stakeholders being involved in the process is key. So I guess um, that leads in very well to the next question, which is uh, related to industry 4.0. And if we look at it in the context of um, sensors and uh, different touch points and having that visibility over trade data, we could put it in the context of logistics 4.0. So um, V, this is a question for you. In considering how industry 4.0 or logistics 4.0, um, and the, uh, the impacts that's going to have in the, the coming years in terms of um, more integration across different platforms. How important are standards uh, when we look at digitization? Thanks so much, Matthew, for that question. And I also um, love the way that you sort of paint the picture beforehand for us to understand the challenges with the um, logistic and supply chain. Um, I think when I'm you know, hearing the um, Lawrence and Phil speak about you know, the challenges and also about communication, the thing for me that comes first to mind is with Industry 4.0, um, you've got, you know, the increased um, visibility of the supply chain. So uh, when I read about the KPMG, they were talking about the future of Industry 4.0 or Logistic 4.0 is an automated supply chain. So that is kind of exciting to see. Um, but for that to happen, you obviously, you know, to digitize anything, I, I came across a quote where they talked about, you know, to digitize, you actually need to standardize first. So um, for me, standardization is really central to everything that we do. It, we're, we're going to be working in that sort of digital economy. Uh, and when you're looking about you know, standards, it really requires everyone to be part of that conversation. So I think um, in terms of you know, being involved with government and industry, you know, that those voices need to be heard so that when you've got these emerging technology that come through such as blockchain or internet of things, um, you know, the way that it can be regulated, where it may have some privacy um, issues, or the way that, you know, there may be some legal implications that comes with those new technology that needs to be considered. So I think in a short um, answer to your question is, it is important. Uh, it's pre pretty much key to um, enabling that uh, cross-border trade. Thanks, V. I guess that leads into the next question. And I think you've already covered a lot of the key aspects there, but some would say that um, if it's not broken, why reinvent the wheel or, or something along those lines? So Lawrence, if we consider um, the approach or, or traditional business models, you know, paper-based uh, processes, um, no uh, connectivity across digital platforms. Um, is it really necessary to, to transform these traditional business models or is it um, just maintain the status quo? What's your thoughts on that, Lawrence? Um, thanks, Matthew. I think uh, in one word, absolutely, you need to change. I mean, I think it goes back to that old adage, if you're not um, you know, moving forward, you're going backwards. And when it comes to logistics, supply chain, even customer service expectations has gone through the roof when it comes to things like e-com and last mile. So you can only have that level of uh, ability to be competitive in, in any sub type of industry or supply chain sector now. You really need to have um, a, a, at least up to date, but ideally aim towards continual improvement as well. So you can uh, 
really analyze, and you mentioned this before, Matthew, as well, with your opening about you can only measure something, sorry, you can only improve something when you can measure it. And when it comes to all the, the data, the analytics, um, the AI, the, all the IoT that's going to start to really grab hold of logistics, um, that gives us the ability to really find, finally understand and analyze where the areas of supply chain are, are falling over or can be improved. So I think as businesses get smarter and they start to use these type of technologies, then they, they, the difference between the customer service and their service offering in general becomes chalk and cheese for companies who don't adapt and really move with the times. Phil, I guess you would see it in the, um, the logistics sector. Um, when you're looking at, at pitching um, an engagement or a, a project to a client, um, and there might be other businesses uh, tendering for that particular project. Um, do you see technology being part of that market differentiation? I, I do to a certain extent. I think that um, the, with global freight forwarding um, companies um, all often using common software, uh, we use, um, look, when I started in shipping, uh, in, in Melbourne, if we wanted to see if a vessel came in, we used to go to the top of the AMP building in the city and look out and you could you know, physically see uh, across the port whether the ship had burst. Now the technology just is, is so much different. Uh, we use um, public available tracking to, to see where a vessel is at any particular time. Uh, we use a lot of digital cameras, uh, which are all um, uh, publicly available. So. Um, it's evolving, uh, technology is evolving uh, for everybody, but at the end of the day, um, logistics is like a lot of businesses, it's people related. So you need the people uh, in, in the team that can uh, provide you the, the service. Um, technology is great. Um, when things improve, it improves pretty much for everybody, but you, you still have to deal with people and they have to, to use it. The other thing that I would say with technology um, is that a lot of people have the technology, but they don't use it. Um, they'll have a computer, they'll use 5% of the available um, uh, processes that, that their equipment can provide. Um, but yeah, look, if, if we're doing a, um, a, a big project, uh, technology is, is important um, and probably, uh, being flexible so we don't have one type of technology that, um, that, that we use but our client uses a different one. I think um, tailor-making solutions for companies is probably the most important part of a, a project. You know, we, we'll, we'll deal with somebody that's moving a transformer from, from Europe to Australia that, that wants to be physically phoned every five minutes how it's, uh, how it, where it is, how it's coming, um, we'll have other, other clients that only want us to communicate via computer, send them a, a computer generated status report. Um, we want people that want uh, photographs uh, along the lines and we want other people that don't care. So the secret to good logistics is being able to tailor make it for, for the client. Um, when we talked about communication and, and freight rates and things like that as well, um, and I saw one of the, the, the questions that's already come through on the, on the computer. I think from a shipping lines pers uh, perspective as, as well, they don't like companies ringing up at the last minute and say, I've got 10 40 foot containers, open tops to ship out of Hamburg next week, uh, where the client may have known about that, you know, for the last six weeks. Um, so the, the most, um, it's no good having the technology unless you use it. You've got to ring the people, let them know what you're planning to, uh, to, uh, to do. Um, but with regards to technology, as, as far as tenders go, uh, it's, it's tailor-making. It's just depending on what, what the, the client uh, specifically needs as well. Yeah. Thanks, Phil. I think um, bespoke solutions certainly are um, at the forefront of uh, market differentiation when there's many different businesses all um, offering the same essential services. It's that level of being able to create a bespoke solution which uh, sets the, um, the competitors apart. Um, 
the I guess um, in terms of bespoke solutions and um, being able to connect different platforms, interoperability, it's a very big word, but um, you know essentially uh, that means that um, different platforms can communicate to each other effectively. So in terms of um, looking at uh, what's happening in Australia at the moment with the simplified trade system that's currently in negotiation, not sure if the audience is aware of um, what's happening behind the scenes, but that's essentially going to create a more efficient digital platform for industry stakeholder collaboration. And mm -hmm. Uh, v, if you wanted to share a little bit about the importance of industry and government collaboration to achieve um, globally integrated digital platforms. Yes, certainly, Matthew. Um, look, I think um, the obvious answer for me would be yes, you know, you do need that um, in sort of relationship with industry and government when you're setting uh, global standards. Um, and again, when you're talking about interoperability, you know, when you're trading across countries, you want to be able to have that seamless interaction. So having a simplified, as you mentioned, trading system enables that, you know, sort of um, transfer of information between borders. So yeah, it is uh, quite critical. And I suppose in terms of standards, when we talk about standards, you'll find a lot of the time standards are voluntary, um, but they are there to support, you know, government regulation or legislation. So we always see um, when we're developing standards or, you know, in my previous role um, in Standards um, Australia, there is always a need to have government and industry working together to create these standards. Um, because without that kind of collaboration, then it pretty much um, sort of limits the, um, you know, the, I suppose, the scaling of the systems or the product that we're using. Uh, and I can only, you know, encourage uh, people who are either experts in their field um, or, you know, if they work in government, that there is that need to have that sort of um, open dialogue when you, particularly when we talk about new um, emerging technology. And the one thing that I always sort of tend to point to are things like blockchain. So it is a new emerging technology. It will enable you to, you know, have visibility and provenance of your supply. But to do so, you also need to have the regulatory environment to support that kind of technology use. And I think I, uh, someone mentioned in one of the um, notes that I posted on LinkedIn, they were talking about the role of regulation. And I kind of mentioned that, you know, when you talk about, let's say, smart contracts, then you're starting to use that technology to, um, you know, exchange, um, you know, of goods and services, it's important that government also has a voice and, and also be able to facilitate the use of that technology um, in industry. Um, so again, I think I just wanted to reinforce the fact that um, I see government and uh, industry are really key players um, to enable us to sort of harness the technology or any future technology, we need to be able to work hand in hand. Um, and I think that's where I've seen the most value uh, when you have those two coming together and developing those standards. Matthew, you're on mute. Oh, I've been hearing that a lot lately, and I'm sure we all have. Uh, it's the, the COVID story of you're on mute. Um, thank you, V. I was saying that um, great insights into a very important area of industry and, and uh, government collaboration. And um, that leads into the next question, which is very um, timely. It's technology related, but at the same time, it's very much focused on looking at um, ethical uh, sourcing of um, materials and um, I thought it would be timely to, to raise this as a topic um, given that there's been um, a bill uh, recently passed through uh, Parliament relating to uh, forced labour. Um, Lawrence is very well aware of uh, the implications of, of what this uh, will um, have for um, importers into Australia and um, so Lawrence, um, in your view, ethical sourcing, uh, why does it matter and how can a business minimise the risk of modern slavery occurring within the supply chain? And I guess if you could put a technological slant on it as well, that would, that would be uh, perfect. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'll do my best. Thanks, Matthew. So um, you're very right. It, it has become a really important issue, even more so after the 23rd of August, just a, a week or so ago, as you pointed out, um, the forced labour, the ban on forced um, labour products as an, uh, for imports passed through the Senate. Um, it still has a bit of a way to go if it's going to be ratified, but it's actually passed through the Senate. 
It'll then have to go through, I believe, uh, the lower house and then uh, become a, an act, so to speak. But it's um, it's been brought about by the Commonwealth Act, the Modern Slavery Act that was uh, signed off back in 2018, came into force last year. And what this essentially means is that companies with the Modern Slavery Act is already in place and already enforceable, where companies have a certain turnover threshold, have to declare modern slavery statements. But the force bill sorry, the forced labor bill that came into play that passed the, the Senate last week or so was even more, has got more teeth, if you like, because what that means is it actually stops the products coming in at the border, it becomes a prohibited import. So if that, um, if that gets passed uh, right through the whole process of, of legislation, that is a, a real game changer. And the only way to do that from a technological point of view is to really get back to that visibility and provenance that we all talked about um, so far on today's session. It really is about making sure that you can verify and validate um, by using technology the, the provenance uh, of the, the goods and who's been involved with that uh, labor across the supply chain. And it's a much easier thing to say than to actually put in practice. So you, you must rely on so many things because there's you know, the, the whole term supply chain is made up of so many links across that, that chain of, of manufacturing. Um, there's a whole range of questions that this whole bill is going to open up a can of worms. How far down the rabbit hole do you want to go? Is it tier one, tier two, and so forth? So there's a whole range of technology, as uh, as V's pointed out, that I think companies are scrambling to get um, hold of because they can see that this is going to be forced upon them, not just here in Australia, but right, especially around Europe, the US, have already um, implemented a similar bill. And from over the last couple of years, I think it's the last three years, there's been 23 incidents where they've stopped product at the border. So it's already taken shape. It's already been enforced in the US. The Europe FTAs, there's things around sustainability. There's obviously things around human rights. These type of things are gonna start taking shape at a rapid rate over the coming years. So companies, especially larger companies who've got very complex supply chains and, and product sourcing, they really need to have bona fide and this is where I think where V's expertise is so important, is to understand how do you validate what are the standards that can be applied across multiple suppliers, multiple stakeholders, um, and how do you verify that in a third party or at least ways that can't be manipulated? And that's where those distributed ledgers or blockchain technology are so valuable. Thank you, Lawrence. Um, that's covered the main uh, questions that um, I have for um, the panelists today. Um, I guess now would be a great opportunity to, to have a look at um, some of the questions that have been put forward by the audience. Um, I think um, the, the best one to start with at this point would be um, looking at um, the question about um, blockchain technology. And this is something, V, I'm sure that um, you would be aware to a certain extent with your interaction with standards, but how far progressed is the integration of blockchain technology in the global supply chain industries? Well, I, I can't profess to being an expert in the supply chain um, sector, but I suppose um, when we were looking at blockchain standards uh, internationally and working with you know, various um, countries, I think there was over 100 countries who were involved in developing um, blockchain standards. And one of the things we did ask for is, you know, like use cases of where blockchain is actually um, where blockchain is actually, um, you know, applied in the industry. And there were some um, sort of, uh, I suppose, uh, examples of that. But as I think, as I mentioned in one of my articles, blockchain is still an emerging technology and it hasn't been really widely adopted at the enterprise level. So I think there are some sort of like, you know, um, you know, examples of it, but I haven't actually seen, you know, in terms of, you know, from a supply chain, uh, where it's been sort of adopted, whole, you know, um, broadly across the organisation. Okay, that, that's okay. I think um, to give a, a good current example of um, supply chain and, and using uh, blockchain technology, uh, mm. Maersk Trade Lens is um, a very good example. Um, now, Maersk, as everyone knows, is a, is a shipping line, but um, the whole purpose of their Trade Lens platform is connecting 
different trade stakeholders, whether it's the ports, different freight forwarders and other uh, logistics businesses, they're all connected on this trade lens platform and they're sharing information. And the idea behind using blockchain is uh, the concept of smart contracts. And that's what you were referring to before, V. And it's very useful in the context of um, uh, bills of lading or shipping documents or, um, you know, in terms of looking at the platform and not having any of those elements um, subject to uh, fraud or, or being able to be altered within the process. Once it's on the blockchain, it's in the distributed ledger and that's the benefit of using it as a technology. Um, so I guess that's one uh, very uh, prominent example. I know that there's also um, trials or pilot studies being conducted, particularly at the Port of Brisbane, um, looking at how container visibility and movements across the, the port can be supported by blockchain technology. And they've shown that it can save up to $400 uh, a container uh, utilizing this type of a system with increased visibility. So it is in its very early stages um, in terms of um, its development. However, I think um, due to the nature of technology changing rapidly, that's where there's probably going to be a hybrid outcome that um, it becomes more mainstream. And when you look at interoperability across platforms, you know, we look at our mobile phones, Samsung communicating to, um, to, to Apple and vice versa. Um, the key thing is smart systems being able to communicate with each other. Um, and Matthew, I, I should mention that I, I think FRA um, issued the first blockchain bills of lading last year um, and checking with our clients globally, um, I think it's generally agreed that the, the uptake will be a lot slower than was originally predicted for blockchain. Um, I, I somehow compare it a little bit to, to Bitcoin. Um, where we also, you know, had to um, do some research to understand which clients would be wanting to pay by Bitcoin as well. And at the, at the moment, I think both Bitcoin and blockchain, the, the uptake is extremely low. Um, so it's, it's, it hasn't infiltrated our uh, trade uh, systems as, as much as was predicted a, a year or so ago. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think you're right, Phil. And I suppose, you know, going on Matthew's comment, there are in you know instances of it being used. Um, but I think, as I said, in the international arena, we haven't seen like a strong sort of usage of blockchain. But its capability, um, when I, the ones I've seen, for example, ASIC, they use blockchain with their share trading system, and it is um, an amazing, you know, sort of opportunity because you can instantaneously see, see the information as it gets transferred from one party to the other. Um, but as you said, Phil, they're probably still, um, you know, reviewing whether that can be applied and scaled up across you know, the industry. Mm -hmm. Phil, I guess the, um, the other question that's in the, the comments there is, um, you know, so that uh, businesses can better anticipate what's around the corner. Is there a, a particular logistics company or is there a um, shipping line that, you um, seems to have the market share at the moment, or um, how do you see the dynamics of um, controlling the, the freight? Um, is that um, one particular company or is it the supply and demand issue? Well, I think that you've opened up uh, an opportunity for me to plug FRAC because, I mean, if there's, if there's one company that can uh, help the clients, of course it's, it's FRAC. But no, look, there's, there's no one uh, there's no one system or uh, organisation that's sort of um, um, got the, the, the main part of the pie, I, I suppose. Um, but like I said before, the, the, the main thing at the moment is that um, we're all, we're, we're sort of all in it together a little bit. Um, we, you know, we, we, we have to work with the shipping lines, whether we like it or not. Um, there's various shipping lines so that they've got com competition between themselves. I think from a, an importer and exporter's point of view, uh, the best thing that they can possibly do is just communicate what they're planning to do in, in, uh, in, the, uh, in the, the foreseeable future. 
and just so everybody can plan around and uh, and understand what they should be planning for. Um, it, 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 it's impossible at the moment. Uh, There's some comments before about freight rates going up or down. Um, I wouldn't like to predict where freight rates will be, you know, this time next year. Uh, you know, anything's possible. We've already seen some uh, of the air freight rates drop significantly since uh, the um, since the airlines have restructured a little bit and, uh, and have started taking more freight in the in the uh, passenger compartments as well as as belly cargo. So um, yeah, my my my. Um, my answer to your question is that there's yeah there's no one company or one shipping line sort of um, controlling the market or with a better feel of the market. Yeah. Thanks, Phil. Uh, and that concludes uh, the the formal uh, aspects of the the panel discussion. Uh, Matthias, uh, over to you. Thank you very much, Matthew. Um, fantastic panel, fantastic briefing at the start as well on the current market. Um, I've definitely learned a lot. I think I've learned a lot throughout the process, but even more today. Um, thanks a lot, Lawrence, V and Phil, of course. I'd just like to ask all our speakers, um, where can, how can people get in touch with you? What's the easiest if they have any specific questions? Would you if you, you'd be willing to share your email address or uh... certainly um, email or even uh, contact via LinkedIn is fine. Uh... Yeah, yeah look, from my point of view, LinkedIn, um, we're all on LinkedIn. Um, and um, I think that's probably uh, the, the, the best way to make contact. And um, yeah. Agree with that. LinkedIn's always uh, an easy one for all, all the different correspondents for me as well. Fantastic. Perfect. Well, In the same. Great. Thank you, V. Um, thanks again, everyone. Thank you to all participants as well. Thanks for coming in. Uh, quick information if you didn't catch the start, the whole uh, session has also been recorded and we'll be sending that out within the next couple of days. So you can uh, always review the, the entire webinar. But on that, um, thanks again. And I wish you all a pleasant afternoon and a good rest of the week. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matthew. Thank, Thank you. you. See you.